name is Stuart Scott and welcome to the sixth virtual walking tour based on Bob Reed's Magical London, where we explore the history of magic in the streets of London. Today we're taking the Hello Central walk. This is the final walking tour in Bob's wonderful collection. This tour is a bit of a monster, so with so many places to visit and so many stories to hear, uh, I've opted to split this tour over two different videos, so feel free to either watch them individually or back to back, it's up to you. The first part of the tour takes us from BBC Broadcasting House to the location of St George's Hall, past the home of Pepper's Ghost, to the Palladium Theatre, then down Regent Street to the world's finest toy shop, and finally to Piccadilly Circus. As ever, we'll be using photos, videos, maps and Google Street View to take you around following Bob's guidebook notes. The tour is based on Bob's original 2005 tour, but it does have a few embellishments from me. Now, we're going to start right here at the BBC's Broadcasting House. This is the headquarters of the British Broadcasting Corporation, and we're just north of Oxford Street. You can see that this walk covers this part of central London, and on the zoomed in map, you can see that we're starting just north of Oxford Circus. The first radio broadcasts were made from this building in 1932. It's the home to the BBC's Radio Theatre, where music and speech programmes are recorded in front of live studio audiences. There's quite a history of magic and magicians on the radio. In the 1920s, magician and radio broadcaster A.J. Allen was featured on the BBC. A.J. Allen was the stage name of Leslie Harrison Lambert, born in 1833. Lambert trained as a surveyor before learning magic and joining the magic circle. During World War I, he became a radio ham, and at the start of the war, he volunteered to work at the Coast Guard station in Norfolk, intercepting German radio transmissions. By November 1914, he was employed by the Admiralty, working out of Naval Intelligence Room 40, although officially he was working for the Foreign Office. In 1919, Room 40 became part of the new Government Code and Cipher School, and eventually Lambert transferred to Bletchley Park, by which time he was an important official in Navy intelligence. Between the war, he contacted the BBC and suggested that he might tell one of his short stories on the radio. His offer was accepted, and he broadcast My Adventure in German Street on the 31st of January, 1924. Following his immediate success, he quickly became one of the most popular broadcasting personalities of the time. He went to considerable trouble over writing each story, taking a couple of months over each one and only broadcasting about five times a year. He carefully constructed an apparently conversational style, making his stories seem like anecdotes concerning strange events that happened to him. The endings were whimsical and unexpected. Three collections of his stories were published. He made his last broadcast on the 21st of March, 1940. It was in the late 1940s that the BBC broadcast sensational programmes featuring the Piddingtons. Sidney Piddington, born in 1918, and Leslie Piddington, born in 1925, were an Australian husband and wife performing duo specialising in mentalism. They presented one of the most famous stage and radio telepathy acts of the modern age. Sidney spent time in Changi Prison of War Camp during World War II. He developed a mentalism act as entertainment for the other troops. During this time, he developed unique and innovative techniques to give the appearance of mind reading. Sidney and Leslie met after the war when she was a leading lady at the Minerva Theatre in Sydney, Australia. They performed many amazing acts for the BBC. These included the diving bell experiment, where Leslie was submerged in a diving bell in a swimming pool in Surrey, while Sydney conducted tests with a live audience at the BBC studios in central London. There was the Tower of London test, where Leslie was kept under armed guard at the Tower of London and Sydney was in the studio. Even at that distance, Leslie was able to determine which items members of the live audience were holding up. The Strato Cruiser broadcast had Leslie cruising at an altitude in a British military plane and determined the personal possessions of an audience member chosen at random by a panel of judges in the studio. The Piddingtons never claimed to possess any paranormal abilities. Their cunning methods were a closely guarded secret, unknown to even the BBC producers. Following Sydney's death in 1991, 
Leslie is said to have told her grandson, even if I wanted to tell you how it was done, I don't think you'd be able. To this day, the Piddingtons are considered one of the greatest two-person telepathy acts of all time. Moving forward to the 1990s, you ought to meet Brian Sibley. In 1996, broadcaster and Magic Circle member Brian Sibley produced a BBC Two radio show, Magic Moments, which celebrated 90 years of the Magic Circle. The show featured a host of magic talent, including David Berglas, Bobby Bernard, Eddie Dawes, Jack Delvin, Ian Keeble, and David Weeks. Brian has an impressive history on radio as a broadcaster and writer. He co-wrote the classic 1981 adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, dealing with an entire magical world. The epic show consisted of 26 half-hour-long episodes, with voice talents including Ian Holm and Bill Nye. Brian Sibley has also served as Chair of the Magic Circle Council and Chair of the Magic Circle Foundation. Chris Cox is a magician and mentalist. He's appeared on Children's BBC in BBC Three's Killer Magic, and he also toured with The Illusionists, as well as being in The West End's Impossible Show. He's the only mind reader in history to play Broadway, London's West End, and Sydney Opera House. Chris also has a radio career and was the writer and producer for Matt Edmonds on BBC Radio 1 and the assistant producer on The Chris Moyle Show. Of course, these days it's all podcasts, and in the world of British magic, there is one podcast that sits head and shoulders above the others. Richard Young's The Magician's Podcast ran from October 2014. Each episode was an interview with a different magician. The list of guests reads like a who's who of the world's most famous magicians. People like Teller, Matt King, Wayne Dobson, Hans Clock, Darren Brown, Debbie McGee, David Berglas, Piff the Magic Dragon, Dynamo, and David Williamson. And that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. Each episode is a full-length interview with a magic professional. Richard Young, the host of the show, is an Oxford-based magician specialising in close-up magic. He's a member of the Inner Magic Circle with Gold Star, and has appeared on Penn and Teller Fool Us with his stage partner, Sam Strange, as well as touring with the Champions of Magic. Now, just to the south of the building, we can find a plaque commemorating where the Queen's Hall was. Queen's Hall stood here from 1893 to 1941, and it was a leading concert hall. It was destroyed during the Blitz. You can see on the map that it was adjacent to St George's Hall. Number four, Langham Place, was the entrance to St George's Hall. The hall was built in 1867, and it was only in 1890 that the numbers 20 and 21 were demolished for the Queen's Hall. The entrance to St George's Hall was moved to Mortimer Street. St George's Hall could accommodate 800 to 900 people, or up to 1,500 including the galleries. For three decades, it was known for its presentations of the German Reed entertainments, alongside other musical works and lectures. And it was here, in 1867, that the Davenport brothers performed. Ira Erastus Davenport, born in 1839, and his brother, William Henry Davenport, born in 1841, the sons of a policeman from Buffalo, New York, claimed to have supernatural abilities, and they toured the world performing demonstrations of apparent spiritual contact. They began performing their act in 1854, less than a decade after spiritualism had taken off in America, following the tales of the Fox sisters. Their father would manage them, and the group was also joined by one William Fay, a fellow resident of Buffalo and a magician. The act was introduced by a spiritualist minister who assured the audience that the brothers worked by spirit power rather than underhanded trickery. The Davenport brothers' most famous effect was the box illusion, or spirit cabinet. The brothers would sit inside a large cabinet along with various musical instruments. They would be tied up to ensure there was no possibility of them interfering with the instruments. The doors of the cabinet would be closed, and suddenly the instruments could be heard. When the doors were reopened, the brothers were still tied up in their positions. Many who witnessed these feats were convinced that supernatural forces were the only possible explanation. Various magicians would expose the trickery of the Davenport brothers, including Scottish magician John Henry Anderson, Frenchman jean eugene Robert Houdin, and American John Mulholland. In his book, A Magician Among the Spirits, Houdini would report that Ira Davenport confessed that he and his brother had faked their spirit phenomena. 
The Davenports toured the US for 10 years before traveling to England. Their act at St. George's Hall would incense one 26-year-old man in the audience, the magician J.N. Maskelyne. Maskelyne, a born showman, stood up in the auditorium and informed the audience that the Americans' tricks were done with dexterity and there was nothing supernatural. He even promised to duplicate every part of the act within three months. And he did. Born in 1839 in Cheltenham, John Neville Maskelyne became a trainee watchmaker with a gift for constructing mechanical illusions such as singing canaries in cages or clockwork beetles, which were all the rage in the early Victorian era. Three months after seeing the Davenport brothers perform with their claims of paranormal ability, J.N. Maskelyne staged a show with his partner George Cook. That night, buoyed by applause, the pair decided to quit their jobs and change modern magic forever. Instead of solemn hocus-pocus done in dramatic silence, they planned to deliver amusing playlets, stories, banter and breathtaking mechanics. Maskelyne and Cook became the regular showrunners at the famous Egyptian Hall on Piccadilly. After the German Reed Entertainment shut up shop at St George's Hall in 1895, the building changed its name to the Matinee Theatre and presented high-class vaudeville. But this did not prove successful and it eventually closed in 1904. In 1905, John Neville Maskelyne renovated, expanded and reopened it as St George Hall, England's new home of mystery. Maskelyne would stage magic shows through Maskelyne's Theatre of Mystery. The theatre also hosted meetings of the Magic Circle. The venue was acquired for the BBC in 1933 for broadcasts of vaudeville comedy and review shows. It sustained extensive damage during the Blitz in 1943 and was finally demolished in 1966. We now head around the BBC to Langham Street and just behind us is Middleton Place, which was the home to Middleton Buildings. If we take a look at the map, you can see our route here. Somewhat bizarrely, of the two signs at the north part of the street, one proclaims it is formerly Middleton Buildings, while the other, more modern one, claims it was formerly Middleton Buildings. Either way, Middleton Buildings was home to Routledge, the publishers. Established in 1836, they found success publishing works of fiction to rail travellers. As well as the likes of Beatrix Potter, they also published the works of Professor Hoffman. Professor Hoffman was the pseudonym of Angelo John Lewis, born in 1839. He was an English barrister and writer who had been described as the most prolific and influential magic author and translator until modern times. Lewis was born in London in 1839. He became a barrister in 1861 and in the early 1860s learned magic from a book and became an amateur magician. It was in 1873 that he published a series of articles in Routledge's Every Boy's Annual. This would launch his career as an author of magic books. His articles would be expanded into the classic magic book, Modern Magic, first published in 1876. He used the pen name Professor Hoffman because he feared his professional prospects as a lawyer might be damaged if it became known that he possessed such an intimate knowledge of the art of deception. He authored a children's book called Conjurer Dick in 1886. His classic, Modern Magic, sold out its first run of 2,000 books in just seven weeks. It had three sequels. More Magic, published in 1890, Later Magic in 1903, and Latest Magic in 1918. They've all been reprinted numerous times and are still in print, and they're used by magic enthusiasts today. First editions of Modern Magic command high values both in the world of magic and amongst collectors of rare books. Modern Magic covered a wide range of topics from coin and card magic to magic with watches, rings, dominoes and dice. We're now going to head back to Langham Place and behind me you can see the Langham Hotel but we're going to keep going south to Westminster University. And here we are. So inside is the Regent Street Cinema and this venue was made famous by Professor Pepper and it was here that Truey exhibited early movies. It's regarded as the birthplace of British cinema. You can now see our route on the map.
Regent Street Cinema was opened in 1848 and featured the first motion picture show in the UK. It was housed in the flagship building of the Royal Polytechnic Institution, which is now known as Westminster University. When it was first opened, it was used as a theatre. In late February 1896, the cinema played a short movie by the famed Lumiere brothers. In 1951, it screened La Vie Commence Demain, or Life Begins Tomorrow, an X-rated French movie. It was X-rated due to its war imagery. It continued to screen films for 84 years until it was closed for 34 years from 1980 to 2015. But you can catch the latest movies here today. A friend of the Lumiere brothers and one of their regular screen actors was Frenchman Felicien Truy. It was Truy who screened the first films here on Regent Street. Truy appeared in the films shown right here. He was a magician, comedian, tightrope walker, balance artist, dancer, musician, card thrower, and mime artist. He also performed shadowgraphy, making images with his hands, and chapeaugraphy, creating shapes with his hat. At seven years old, he decided to become a magician when he saw a conjurer performing at a circus in Marseille. He would perform punch and judy shows at back windows to his father's house by draping rags over his hands. He worked in a factory for a while and delighted in balancing various objects like hammers and vices. At 15, he decided to perform publicly. He ran away with another acrobat and the two boys would perform at cafes. Truy would juggle knives, bottles and forks. His reputation grew and he ended up performing in Marseille Music Hall. By 17, he was performing at the Alcazar, a key amusement venue in Marseille. He toured the south of France performing magic, circus skills and clowning. He would often perform in a black, skin-tight costume, a chalked face and a powdered wig. After nine years in Paris, he toured throughout Europe. In 1889, when he was 40, he joined the great magician Alexander Herman in New York. He also played in several films directed by his good friend Louis Lumiere, including Chapeau de Transformation in 1895, Photograph in 1895, Dances de Rue in 1896, and an uncredited role in the 1895 Pâté de Cartes. It was Truy, acting as the Lumiere brothers' manager, who chose the Polytechnic as the natural venue for a cinematograph show on the 20th of February, 1896. After a long, successful and eventful life, he died aged 72. This was the same year that his book, The Art of Shadowgraphy, How It's Done, was published. It was also here at Westminster University that Pepper's Ghost was premiered in 1862. Pepper's Ghost is a theatrical optical illusion developed by John Pepper and Henry Dirks. It's still used today in theatres, museums, concerts and amusement parks. Sometimes referred to as Dirksian phantasmagoria, the illusion involves a stage specially arranged with two areas. One into which the audience can see, and a second, sometimes referred to as the blue room, that's hidden to the side or sometimes below the stage. A plate of glass is placed somewhere in the main room at an angle that reflects the view of the blue room towards the audience. The plate glass needs to be as invisible as possible, normally hiding the edges in patterned flooring and keeping it polished to avoid any unintended reflections. The effect is one of images from the blue room being superimposed over the live action of the main room. Lighting changes can be used to switch the audience's view between the main room and the blue room. Henry Dirks was born in 1806. He was a Liverpudlian engineer and the main designer of the illusion in 1858. He was a practical engineer with experience of railways, canals and mining work before becoming a consulting engineer. He also investigated attempts at the invention of a perpetual motion device, writing that those who sought to create such a thing were half learned or totally ignorant. John Henry Pepper was born in Westminster in 1821. He was a British scientist and inventor who toured the English speaking world with his scientific demonstrations. He entertained royalty and fellow scientists with a wide range of technological innovations. He first lectured here at the Royal Polytechnic Institution in 1847. By the early 1850s, he was its director. He oversaw the introduction of evening lectures 
and he became highly regarded as a science performer and often went by the name Professor Pepper. He regularly demonstrated a range of scientific and technological innovations with the intention of entertaining and educating the audience about how they worked. Pepper debuted his ghost illusion after taking out a joint patent with Dirks. It was a Christmas Eve production of Charles Dickens' play The Haunted Man in 1862. An actor would appear like an ethereal, ghost-like creature able to move among the other actors on stage. Dirks signed over all financial rights to Pepper, and the illusion would take Pepper's name, becoming known as Pepper's Ghost, much to the frustration of Dirks, even though Pepper insisted that Dirks should have a shared credit. Various audience members were intrigued by the effect, and people would return repeatedly to attempt to work out how it was done. Famed physicist Michael Faraday eventually gave up and requested an explanation. Pep had many other interesting accomplishments. In 1863, he illuminated Trafalgar Square and St Paul's Cathedral with electric light to celebrate the marriage of Edward Albert, Prince of Wales, and Alexander of Denmark. In 1867, at a banquet of noblemen and scientific gentlemen, he arranged for a telegram to be sent between Arthur Wellesley, the second Duke of Wellington, and Andrew Jackson, President of the United States, who was in Washington at the time. The message took just 10 minutes to arrive in the USA, with a reply coming in after around 20 minutes, a precursor to the internet. And while in Australia in 1882, Pepper tried unsuccessfully to make it rain using electrical conduction and large explosions. This is the advert in the Brisbane Courier. Thomas Tobin is known to have performed here. He was a chemist, architectural apprentice, and scientific lecturer who was born in 1844. He created and painted many illusions, including the Sphinx illusion. The Sphinx illusion was presented to the public by ventriloquist and magician Joseph Stoddard. Stoddard, born in 1831, went by the stage name Colonel Stoddair. He would enter the stage carrying a small box which he placed on a table. The front of the box could be opened to reveal a disembodied Egyptian head. The Sphinx head would open its eyes, smile and speak in verse. It would also reply to questions. The act would end with the box being closed, and when reopened, the head had vanished, replaced by ashes. From the University of Westminster, we're now going to head south to Oxford Circus. Now, we cross Oxford Street and we're going to continue down Regent Street. Uh, to the corner of Little Argyle Street. And it was here at 248 Regent Street that the Italian magician Capelli performed. Capelli performed magic here and he performed at the Cosmorama at 209 Regent Street. His act included magic and cats. His feline assistants would beat a drum, play an organ, turn on a spit, ground knives, hammer on an anvil, ground coffee and ring a bell. One of the cats understood French as well as Italian and responded to instructions in both languages. Another curious act to perform at the Argyle Rooms was Chabert, the fire eater. Ivan Ivanitz Chabert, later known as Xavier, was a Frenchman and a soldier of the Napoleonic War, born in 1792. He would display his incombustibility as well as some dubious treatment of animals. He performed as the Fire King in London in 1818 and his act included holding his hand over flames, inhaling vapours, and his peste de resistance was a brilliant firework display about his person, leaving his shirt burnt off his back. He would eat phosphorus and then wash it down with arsenic. He'd swallow boiling oil and reach into molten lead with his naked hand. He also offered to imbibe prussic acid, the most powerful known poison, if any good-natured person could furnish him with it. When Dr. Thomas Wakeley of The Lancet heard about this claim, he felt that any antidote to prussic acid should be shared with the medical community. He duly arrived at a performance with prussic acid, but Chaubert declined to swallow it, instead claiming he would administer it to his two dogs. One would die, and one would survive if administered Chaubert's antidote. This understandably angered the audience, and he clearly underestimated the British love of animals. His popularity wanes somewhat after this episode. Another grand illusion he performed was being sealed in a large oven which was heated to 104.5 degrees Celsius or 220 degrees Fahrenheit and he had remained in there 
talking to the audience through a metal tube while a rump steak and a leg of lamb cooked next to him. On the opposite side of Regent Street, you can find Hanover Square, and this was the location of the Hanover Rooms. Now this was another location that showed a lot of magic acts, including the Davenport brothers. But we're gonna turn and we're gonna head down Little Argyle Street. And at the end of the street, we find the London Palladium. Originally it was opened in 1871 as Hengler's Circus, but it was later rebuilt in 1910 and the rebuild was designed by Frank Matcham. Hengler's Circus, or Hengler's Grand Cirque, stood on the site of the home of the Dukes of Argyle, Argyle House. The land was acquired by Charles Hengler, a lifelong circus performer, who opened his circus here in 1871. It had a capacity of 1,090. However, when it was condemned as a fire hazard, it had to be rebuilt in 1884. After Hengler's death in 1887, his sons took over, but circus was falling out of favour. In 1895, it became the National Skating Palace, famed for having real ice. And in 1905, it was renamed the Royal Italian Circus. But by this time, the London Hippodrome was already a success as a combined circus and music hall. In 1910, a new music hall was built and the London Palladium was opened on the 26th of December. The building was brilliant in white and gold with seating in warm red. It was reported that the house sounds the last word in luxury and appointment. It was designed by English architect Frank Matcham. Frank Matcham was born in Devon in 1854 and specialised in the design of theatres and music halls. He worked extensively in London. He designed the Hippodrome in 1900, the Hackney Empire in 1901, the Colosseum in 1903 and the Palladium in 1910. He also worked on the Tower Ballroom at Blackpool Tower and the Grand Theatre in Blackpool. His last commission was the Victoria Palace in 1911. His designs made use of cantilevers for galleries to avoid using columns that might obscure eye lines. And his auditorium decorations mixed Tudor strap work, Louis XIV detail, Anglo-Indian motifs, naval and military in signature, Rococo panels, classical statuary, and Baroque columns. During his 40-year career, Matcham was responsible for the design and construction of over 90 theatres and the redesign and refurbishment of a further 80 throughout the UK. So the question then is, who performed at the Palladium? Well, the list is long and it reads very much like a who's who of magic past and present. In 1911, the great Ramesses and Baltia de Kulta performed here. Ramesses was the stage name of Albert Maczynski, a Polish magician born in 1876. He performed as the Egyptian wonder worker, and it's said that he was inspired by the American magician William Ellsworth Robinson, whose stage persona was the Chinese magician Chung Ling Su. Maczynski had the honor of being the first magician to perform at the Palladium. He became a highly paid music hall artist with shows that contained large illusions, including making assistants appear from small pyramids, using an automaton, which was actually an assistant, producing a duck, and Aisha, queen of the air, where he levitated an assistant while she danced and skipped. One of his younger assistants was Maurice Fogel, who had become a famous magician and mentalist. Boitier de Coulter was a French magician born in 1847. He was an innovator in mechanical magic, and many of his illusions are still performed today, including spring flowers, the multiplying billiard balls, expanding cube, and vanishing birdcage. In the world of magic, he's best remembered for the vanishing woman illusion, where an assistant seated in a chair, covered with a large cloth, and then would vanish completely. Joseph Robert Poulin, an American born in 1874, performed his stage hypnosis act here in 1912 under the stage name Pauline. He started out as a hypnotic subject, but then engaged in the services of a prominent vaudeville director. Almost overnight, Pauline became a star and one of the highest paid performers in vaudeville. He had put an audience member under his spell, commanding them to go rigid, a word that became a popular catchphrase of the day. He was able to balance three grown men on top of a young boy without any injury to the boy. He was able to drain and return blood to a participant's arm, leading to another catchphrase, I want blood. He was clearly a respected hypnotist as well as an impressive performer, authoring a book on catalepsy and psychotherapeutics in 1915. 
Chapters covered psychology of business, the law of suggestion and advertising, and details of his own discovery of blood control. All of which might go some way to explain why the subject in the photos from his books looks absolutely terrified. After the Palladium, he toured in Europe and returned to the US as Professor de Pauline, the French hypnotist, often billing himself as the world's greatest psychologist and hypnotist. His career almost ended in 1925 when he was convicted and sentenced to jail for throwing a waiter off the ninth floor of a New York hotel. Carmo took to the stage here in 1920 and again in 1945. Carmo, or the great Carmo, was an Australian magician, Harry Cameron, born in Brunswick, Melbourne in 1881. Harry didn't tell his parents about his interest in circus and showmanship, frequenting theatre shows without their knowledge. When his father found out about his clandestine plans to join a circus, Harry was issued with the ultimatum, either abandon show business or leave home. Naturally, Harry opted to leave home. He began his career as a strongman and learned wire walking, juggling, quick change and impressions. He learned magic from Victor Martin. Victor's son, Topper Martin, would become a famous juggler and magician. He went on to work with Cervais Leroy in 1905, which would influence his magic career. His journey to England in 1907 was not without issue. His ship, the White Star liner Suvik, hit rocks off Lizard Point in Cornwall. While everyone survived, Harry lost his luggage, but thankfully was able to recover his props. He narrowly avoided a similar disaster when he almost booked passage on the Lusitania in 1915. It was sunk by a German U-boat. He toured the British Isles with an act featuring animals, including a Bengal tiger, an elephant, a leopard, a horse, snakes, and a lion. He performed an illusion that became known as Throne to the Lions. It was considered one of the greatest magic tricks of its time, richly costumed, a silent stage drum with music and lighting. He's also known for the Carmo beads routine, where a handful of beads and a piece of string are swallowed and brought out strung again. As with many magicians of the era, it was common for him to adopt the regalia of other cultures. Here, he's dressed in Arabian-style clothes and shoes. Other performers included Aid Duval in 1934. He was an American magician born in 1898, who was known for his beautiful magic act featuring silk scarves and culminating in rapid-fire production of silks from a small phantom tube. In the 1930s, magic was plagued with imitators, but Duval's act was never copied. His secret to protecting himself against plagiarism and theft was that his act required nearly one and a half hours of preparation before every 12-minute performance. Cardini was on the bill of the Palladium in 1937. Born in Wales in 1895, Richard Valentine Pitchford practised a sleight of hand in the trenches of World War I becoming one of the most respected sleight-of-hand performers in magic history. Robert Harbin was here in 1948. Born in South Africa in 1909, he was a noted inventor of classic illusions, including the zigzag girl. He was also a world authority on origami. In 1951, the Palladium hosted Gali Gali, a Turkish performer born in 1902. Luxor Gali Gali was noted for his Cups and Balls finale, where several live baby chicks were produced. His stage name, Gali Gali, is Quickly Quickly in Turkish, and the title has been used by his family for eight generations. He would carry a card from the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, attesting that no cruelty, only dexterity was used in the handling of the baby chicks. Of course, the tradition of magic at the Palladium continues into the contemporary world. This poster comes from a Paul Stone produced show at the London Palladium in 2011. And you can see a wide range of stars, including American comedy magicians Jeff Hobson and Matt King, British street magician Paul Zenon, and Dutch illusionist Hans Klock. You can also see the great Thompsoni. John Max Thompson, born in 1934, was an American comedian and Las Vegas illusionist. He performed as the great Thompsoni with his wife, Pam Hayes. Their act was Comedy Genius, with the well-dressed Thompson and his gum-popping assistant Pam performing illusions while enduring mishaps. Johnny was considered a virtuoso in the magic community and was a mentor and teacher of magic as well as an inventor. He worked behind the scenes with magicians such as Lance Burton, Chris Angel and Matt Franco. Up until his death at the age of 84, he was a consultant on Penn & Teller Foolish. Unlike Penn and Teller, Johnny knew in advance how all the tricks were done. He was tasked with listening to their deliberations and determining whether or not they'd actually been fooled. 
from the Palladium, we're now going to head on to Great Marlborough Street and then head back to Regent Street. And it was at this corner, at number 210 Regent Street, that Kremer had a magic shop. Mr. W. H. Kremer Jr. was a magician, magic author and shopkeeper. Kremer was born in 1811 and made a living importing and selling toys and games. Amongst his inventory were magic tricks. He edited and wrote a number of books on magic, including The Magician's Own Book, Magic No Mystery, The Secret Out, and Hanky Panky. The Secret Out seems to have been previously published in America with its roots in a translation of a few French texts on magic. It's not clear if Kremer arranged the printing of the book in the UK so he could stock it, or if the publisher thought having a name of a well-known high-class shop owner on the tome would actually help sales. Either way, it seems Kremer had little to do with the actual content. Hanky Panky has been described as cobbled together with 250 illustrations that bear little relation to the tricks they actually describe. Kremer's shop, the Saloon of Magic, was situated variously at 27 New Bond Street and 210 Regent Street. Amateur and professional magicians would purchase equipment from here. One frequent customer was Lewis Carroll. Charles Lutwidge Dodgson was born in 1832. He would become an Oxford Don and a lecturer in mathematics. He would also become an amateur magician. Neither of these pursuits would make him as famous as his writing. It was as Lewis Carroll that he would publish Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass. As a child, he would dress in a long white robe and brown wig to amaze his audiences. He constructed a marionette theatre with the help of his family and a local carpenter and presented plays that he himself had written. His great works of fiction clearly employ conjuring motifs, including the white rabbit and living playing cards. Carol is known to have been influenced by her Dobler, a conjurer, most likely George Buck from Bristol, an excellent sleight of hand performer. Carol would have seen this performance in 1863 in Cheltenham. It's also likely that Carol saw Professor Pepper perform too, as adverts show Pepper visited Cheltenham at that time, and Buck billed himself as Pupil of Pepper. Indeed, the Cheshire Cat, which vanishes quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tale and ending with the grin, could well be described as a Pepper's ghost effect. Given that we've just met one great author at a famous magic shop, it seems an ideal time to visit our next location. This is a magic shop that is difficult and perhaps impossible to locate. The magic shop in question is from a short story by the science fiction author H.G. Wells. In the story, the narrator tells us it was a modest-sized frontage in Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of the patent incubators. The narrator fancied that it was down nearer the circus, or round the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn, something of a mirage in its position. Herbert George Wells was an English writer born in 1866. He became known as the father of science fiction. While H.G. Wells is not known to have been a magician, he clearly had more than a passing interest in the art. And if he had a particular brand of magic, it was clever and thought-provoking science fiction. He's known for classics including The Time Machine, The Invisible Man and The War of the Worlds. His short story, The Magic Shop, was written in 1903. It's a fantasy piece about a father who takes his son to a magic shop on Regent Street and the strange and creepy goings-on in the shop. Imagine, if you will, a traditional magic shop seen through the eyes of a science fiction writer. Wells describes a shop that seems to magically appear when required, allowing admittance to only the most suitable aspiring magicians. The shopman is a skilled magician who performs miraculous acts that cause the father to question reality. Items appear and disappear, selected tricks magically get packed and wrapped, and the father and son finally find themselves magically transported back onto Regent Street. It's a very short story, and while not as famous as some of his other work, it's certainly worth a read. Now, besides his works of fiction, Wells is also known for Wells's Law, which is a notion that a science fiction story should only contain a single extraordinary assumption. And perhaps this is how magic tricks should work. Only one piece of magic, only one extraordinary thing should happen within the narrative. In his introduction to a collection of his works that was published in 1934, he says that as soon as the magic trick has been done, the whole business of the fantasy writer is to keep everything else human and real, 
any extra fantasy outside the cardinal assumption immediately gives a touch of irresponsible silliness to the invention. It seems apt that our next stop is an actual magic shop where real magic still happens and aspiring magicians have been inspired and astounded. Given the timelines, it's possible that the real world store inspired Wells fictional version because right here behind me is Hamley's toy shop. As well as selling the latest toys and games, Hamley's well known for its magic department. Let's take a quick look at the map. You can see our route from Regent Street Cinema, south to Oxford Street to Argyll Street, then to the corner of Great Marlborough Street, before arriving here at Hamley's. Hamley's is situated at 188 to 196 Regent Street and has over seven floors and 5,000 square meters of retail space. It receives around five million visitors each year. Hamley's is described as the world's finest toy store. It was founded by William Hamley as Noah's Ark in High Holborn in London in 1760. It opened its flagship Regent Street branch in 1881, and in 1898 it was further expanded when the store acquired Joseph Bland's establishment, the Magical Palace of Wonders. Joseph Bland was born in the early 1800s and is thought to have worked as a dance instructor before becoming a magician and the most famous and respected magic dealer in Victorian London. He started his dealership in 1855 and had a number of shops that sold magic apparatus. Many of his effects were described by Professor Hoffman in his books Modern Magic and More Magic. In 1863, he moved into a shop at 35 New Oxford Street, and it was after his death in 1898 that his business was taken over by Hamleys. If you visit the Magic Circle Museum, you can see a recreation of the front window of Bland's Magic Palace. Hamleys was a family company, and one important member was John Hamley. He was well known in the world of conjurers. He was the manager and sometimes a guiding spirit of Hamley's magic saloons. He was described as being clever and dexterous in sleight of hand. He was also the creator of numerous ingenious illusions, often without due credit. He was covered on the front page spread of Manhattan magazine in August 1899. Business boomed for Hamley's. The Regent Street store was quite a spectacle with toys, puppets, pedal cars and miniature railway trains. This image is from a Hamley's catalogue that predates the First World War. You can see the address in Paris and Nuremberg. Prices at this time could not be guaranteed on account of the impending war. By the late 1920s, Hamleys, like other businesses during the Depression, was going through hard times. In 1931, the shop was forced to close temporarily for the first time, and its fleet of horse-drawn delivery vans was stopped. This catalogue page is from 1937. It shows various mysterious and magical items, including a crystal ball, fortune-telling cup and saucer, fortune-telling cards, and even a planchette for a Ouija board. In 1938, the company had been bought out and reopened. In the same year, Hamleys received a royal warrant from Queen Mary. Hamleys stayed open during World War II, despite being bombed no less than five times. Staff in tin hats would serve at the shop entrance, rushing in to collect the toys and handing them over at the door. Hamleys would sell their own brand of magic sets for many years. Here's Hamley's Cabinet of Magic set from 1900 to 1910. It contains a black rubber ball that slides down a string, stopping wherever the magician wants it to. There's an egg vase, there's the hammer trick, a dice trick, a glass tumbler, the pepper box, as well as multiplying pennies, card tricks and various other things. This later magic set contains card tricks, a ghost tube and a magic wand, as well as Magic Circle and David Burglass branded items. Of course, the Burglass family name would become synonymous with magic at Hamleys. Marvin Burglass created Marvin's Magic, launching its first magic sets in 1987. Marvin's Magic has gone on to become one of the world's largest magic companies, with outlets in New York, Las Vegas, as well as here in Hamleys. Marvin's Magic employs demonstrators or dems, magicians who perform the tricks, encouraging shoppers to buy the right magic set or trick for their particular needs. Dems tend to be younger, upcoming magicians, and many of the most successful magicians around the UK today are Marvin's Magic alumni. Not all of them are that famous, of course. I used to work in Marvin's Magic here in Hamleys back in 2000, but many of the magicians I worked alongside are still friends, and many of them have seen success in magic and the related arts. People like magician, actor, and voice artist, Robbie McNabb. Robbie is now the Magic Circle's welfare officer. 
There was also Callum McGregor, producer of a series of London-based magic spectacular shows and the nephew of magician Lord John McGregor. There's Alex Lodge, an international illusionist who has appeared on shows like The Sorcerer's Apprentice, Britain's Got Talent and Cruising with the Stars. Kelvin Wilmoth, a South African stage performer who now lives in New Zealand where he performs as Pops, a kid's entertainer. Tarek Knight, a stage close-up and TV magician who's appeared on The Sorcerer's Apprentice, Channel 4's Freaky, Playing Tricks, and even Celebrity Ready Steady Cook. Jonathan Goodwin, escapologist and daredevil who's worked in the West End in shows like Impossible, as well as touring globally, and was the star of several TV shows, including Monkey Magic and The Amazing Mr. Goodwin, as well as appearing on Britain's Got Talent and America's Got Talent. And those are just the magicians I worked with over 20 years ago. So as well as selling magic tricks to the public, Marvin's Magic helps to develop the magicians of the future. And those include a range of people who have gone on to be very successful, including magician and actor Andy Nyman and mentalist Mark Paul and magician and TV presenter Stephen Mulhern. Now, all of the people I've mentioned have one person in common, and that is Magic Circle member and Marvin's Magic trainer, Bruce Smith. Bruce can still be found in Hamleys training young magicians in magic and sales techniques. We now head further down Regent Street until we get to number 95. This was the location of Henry Novra's Magical Repository, which was established in 1844. This image depicts the conjuring table and apparatus of the Victorian era as depicted by Novra. Before we leave Regent Street, we should consider what we would have seen here in 1959. That was the year that David Burglass teleported a passport from the Playhouse Theatre near Charing Cross to a sealed box that was suspended high above Regent Street. A week before the performance, David had the box sealed by representatives of the diplomatic corps. It was a large metal box with a question mark underneath it. He also employed a couple of sandwich men with signs asking, what's in the box? It was suspended over the street by the sea cadets, and the box hung there like a Christmas decoration. During the radio show, a random volunteer from the audience at the Playhouse was selected and asked to provide identification. The man offered his passport. The passport was sealed in a bag and then put in an envelope and hung above the stage. During the show, David explained that they had a broadcast unit by the box on Regent Street. When the envelope was finally lowered, it was found to be empty. David then instructed the team of diplomats at Regent Street to pull the box in and break the seal. When they did, they found the vanished passport and they confirmed the numbers on it and even the profession of the individual who had given them the passport. The passport was eventually returned to its owner, but it took a journey by taxi rather than another teleportation. We'll stay in the company of David Burglas for a moment longer as we head to Piccadilly Circus. Now, it was here that David Burglas made time stand still. A popular radio show called In Town Tonight started in 1933. The show would open with its signature tune, and over the music you could hear the roar of traffic and the hooting of car horns. There was the sound of women selling flowers, a newspaper vendor selling papers. These were the sounds of Piccadilly Circus. Suddenly a voice would call out, Stop! And everything stopped. No traffic, no flower seller, no newspaper vendor. An announcer would say, once again, once again we, we stop, stop the, the mighty roar of London's, London's traffic. traffic. And from the great crowds, we bring to you some of the interesting people who've come by land, sea and air to be in town tonight. It was a clever opening to a radio show. Many decades later, when the show made the transition to the visual media of television, David Burglas hatched a plan to recreate the opening live in Piccadilly Circus. Cameras were set up around the area. One was on top of the Swan and Edgar department store, which would later become Tower Records, a Virgin Mega store, and is currently a Samsung store. David was amongst the crowd. He stood near the Pavilion Theatre in front of the Eros statue. He stretched up both hands and called, Stop! What the cameras caught was unbelievable. The newspaper vendors and the flower sellers were silent and frozen. The neon adverts stopped flickering. The traffic came to an abrupt halt. A cyclist was frozen in space, his wheels apparently glued to the road, supported by nothing. Pedestrians had stopped too, the camera spotted a dog on a leash, as immobile as the lady who walked it. Only David Burglas moved, 
and with a magical gesture he said, carry on London, and the whole area came back to life. While the producers were very pleased with the result, for some reason plans changed, and alas, the footage was never used. Now this has to rank as one of the best illusions never to have reached its audience. Now, as we move around Piccadilly Circus, we can see the Piccadilly Theatre, just through here. This venue housed a production of Ghost in 2011, and its magic consultant was Paul Keeve. The ingenious staging of the musical Ghost made use of the Blue Room Illusion, a more advanced version of Pepper's Ghost, which we saw back at Westminster University. The illusion created by Paul was so astounding that master magician David Copperfield said, it's rare for me to experience wonder, but my friend Paul Keeve gave me that experience. Now, as we continue around Piccadilly, we reach the Pavilion. Now, this was built in 1885, and as a theatre, it introduced the tip-up seat and ticket booking. The likes of De Coulter, David Devant and Truey all performed here, as did Carlton. Carlton was the stage name of Arthur Phelps, born in 1881. He performed as the Human Hairpin, a title based on his slender appearance. He further accentuated his height with a wig to elongate his head. He wore black tights and spoke in a falsetto voice. He found success as a comedy card magician and toured the UK and overseas. At the height of his fame, he earned the equivalent of £50,000 a week. Since 1989, the Magic Circle offers the Carlton Comedy Award to the best comedy magicians. Prior to being the Pavilion Theatre, this area was known as Piccadilly Hall, and it was here that French magician Robin performed scientific experiments. Henri-Joseph Robin, or Henri-Joseph Robin, was born in 1811. He was a graceful French conjurer who was also popular in Britain. Here he's seen performing a second sight demonstration with his female assistant at the Salle de Robin on Piccadilly in 1851. He also performed experiments with the then modern phenomena of electricity and optics. This is one of his publicity photos from 1863. So we've reached Piccadilly Circus, and at this point, we're about halfway through Bob's Hello Central Walk. We visited the BBC and St George's Hall, debunked the Davenport brothers, and met Professor Hoffman. We've been to the birthplace of British cinema and learnt about Pepper's ghost. Then we went on to the Palladium and met a full playbill of magicians, past and present. Then we visited Kremer's Magic Shop, Hamley's and Henry Novera's, and even a fictional magic shop invented by H.G. Wells. We've seen David Berglas make time stand still, and we've seen the modern version of Pepper's Ghost. The next part of the walk is in a separate video, and it will take in Haymarket, Leicester Square and Covent Garden. For now, we'll pause things here in Piccadilly Circus, And I'll see you in part two.